Okay, live stream is up. Sergeant Leonardo with your PC recording. Recording is underway. Thank you, cloud recording, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Riley, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Kevin Rowley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. I am joined remotely today by Council Member Barron, Council Member Miller, Council Member Koo, and Council Member Levin. Today, we will be having a DCAS application for the disposition of development rights at 69 Adams Street in Brooklyn. But first, we will vote on the applications we heard at our March 8th meeting. We will vote on applications related to the four projects in the Manhattan Council District represented by Council Member Perkins. All four projects were submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and the development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 19C of the New York City Charter requesting approval of the designation of four different urban development action areas and approval of four urban development action area projects and dispositions of city owned properties for such areas. We vote to approve LU 743, the Harlem Open Door Cluster. This application concerns property located at 2735 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, 2752 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, 131 West 133rd Street and 130 West 134th Street in Manhattan Council in the Manhattan Community District 10. This application will facilitate the construction of four new affordable home ownership buildings with a total of approximately 48 units. In connection with this project, we will vote to approve LU 744 submitted pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for approval of the related tax exemption. We will vote to approve LU 745, the Harlem NCP CB11 site for, prop for property located at 2 East 130th Street, also in Manhattan Community District 11. This application will facilitate the construction of one four-story affordable rental building with seven units. We will vote to approve LU-746, the Central Harlem Infill NCP project for properties located at 2803 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, 136 137th Street, 203 West 135th Street, 61 West 130th Street, 142 West 129th Street, and 109 West 126th Street in Manhattan Community District of 10. This application will facilitate the de development of five new six-story buildings and one new four-story building, all of which will be fully affordable rental buildings containing a total of 58 units. We will also vote to approve LU-747, the Harlem NCP Western site for property located at 313 West 112th Street in Manhattan Community District 10. This application will facilitate the development of one four-story affordable rental building with seven units. All four projects are in district represented by council member Perkins. We will also vote to approve LU741, the Lower East Side Cluster, ANCP. This is an application submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting waivers of an area designation requirement and the requirements of charter section 19C and 19D and approval of an urban development action area project an exemption from a real property tax taxation for properties located at 406-08 East 10th Street 532 533 East 11th Street and 656 East 12th Street in the Manhattan Council District represented by Councilmember Rivera 
This application will facilitate the preservation of 44 affordable cooperative units pursuant to the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, ANCP. All items being voted on have the support of the local council members. Council, please call the roll. Riley. Yes, aye. Ku. Aye. Baron. Permission to uh, explain my vote and ask questions. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, regarding the Lower East Side project, the 44 units, I read the description. And what concerned me is that the, for those who might not want to purchase their apartments, they would have to pay the existing, the initial, I think it's called the initial maintenance. And I was wondering, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera because I see my connections unstable, but I'm still here. Okay. I, I wanted to know what is the, um, how many persons might there be that would see an increase in their rent beyond what it is that they're presently paying if they choose not to purchase their apartment? For example, the initial maintenance for a studio apartment is $811. If a person were not, if a per, what is that person paying presently? What's the difference in the rents between what's presently being paid and the initial maintenance? And, and my biggest concern, uh, which gets to the heart of this, is that the maintenance is set at 40% of the AMI. And all housing advocates that I've been in touch with aim to say that the, the, the best rent to look at is at 30% of the AMI. So this is substantially more than 30%, and that concerns me. And then the other question that I have is, does anyone know the cost of the home in the home ownership program for the Harlem Open Door Cluster? What is the cost of the home and what would be the mortgage? Because I think it's interesting and great that we're having these home ownership opportunities, but what are we asking people to pay? I have the information for the Lower East Side. Uh, vacant is 228,000, I'm, I'm sorry. Studio is 228,000, one bedroom, 245,000. I have that information, but again, that concerns me with the 40% AMI that's going to be maintenance. And the, for the Harlem Open Door, what is the cost of those home ownership? There are 48 units. What's the cost of purchasing one of those 48 units? Does it vary on the size of the bedrooms uh, or not? So I don't know if you have that, but I can pass to the next person if you need to have someone look that information up. Yes, Council okay. Member Barron. Um, Council, can, can we answer Council Member Barron? The project managers are trying to get you that information and they'll reach out to you directly, but we can pass on you for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Council, uh, Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller. I vote aye. Traeger. I vote aye. As the vote stands now, it's uh, four in the affirmative, zero in the negative with zero abstentions. So the items are approved and recommended to the full land use committee, but we will hold the vote open for council member Barron pending uh, obtaining those answers that she wanted. Thank you. Thank you, council. And we have been joined by council member Traeger. We will now move on to our public hearing. I recognize the subcommittee council again to review today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Jeff Campania, counsel to the subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. 
If you're a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. When the chair recognizes you, please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, if you, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded in the meet to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda. Thank you, Council. We will now hear LU 752, the 69 Adams Street Project. This is an application submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of city-owned property consistent of 98,446 square feet a development rights located on the west side of Pearl Street between York and Front Street at Block 52, Lot 15 and 17 in the borough of Brooklyn. This application will allow the transfer of the development rights to an adjacent pri privately owned site. This proposed action will facilitate the construction of a 25 story mixed use building with residential and commercial use located at 69 Adams Street in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn, of Brooklyn, represented by Council Member Levin. And I wanna um, acknowledge Council Member Levin for being here at the hearing and if he wants to give any words. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just uh, keep it brief. I'm, I'm appreciative of, of the applicant and EDC for uh, being here today to present and um, uh, for being available to answer any questions. Um, this is fairly straightforward um, as an application, but um, I think that there are a number of questions um, that uh, I've been raising um, since becoming aware of this project, um, you know, some time ago, you know, well, well over a year ago, if not two years ago. Um, and specifically um, having to do with the, um, uh, once the uh, disposition were to happen, um, uh, what happens then to that land underneath the bridge, which is the where the air rights uh, are currently, um, because DOT um, uh, has uh, basically occupies uh, four or five um, lots in um, in that neighborhood, you know, totaling probably a couple hundred thousand square feet, maybe a hundred thousand square feet, um, all all told. Um, those. Uh, areas in the neighborhood are blocked off from public use. Um, and so if we're going to be engaging as a city and selling the air rights to part of those uh, parcels, some of those parcels or one of those parcels, um, you know, I think that the public uh, has a reasonable uh, demand to be able to have access, public access um, to those spaces. Um, DOT will tell you that it's the bridge maintenance that needs it. Um, bridge bridge maintenance will tell you that um, you know there must be unfettered um, access by their maintenance teams um, between now and the year uh, 2600 um, AD and um, you know and so um, therefore we can never have any access any public access whatsoever to any of this space under the bridge and we just have to live with that um, that's not really an acceptable position from my view, nor an acceptable position from um, the community's view. In addition, um, uh, I would like to have a, a real conversation around um, what the proceeds of this sale are going to uh, do um, and how they will be um, benefiting the surrounding community, which has a high uh, need for uh, transit improvements. Um, uh, for anyone that's ever taken the F train to Dumbo, there's one station with one platform with one exit and entrance onto that platform at York Street. 
And that's, that's it. And that is not only for the neighborhood of Dumbo, um, it's for the neighborhood of Vinegar Hill and Farragut Houses, um, which is adjacent. Um, and anyone that wants to take the train to the Navy Yard, because that's, that's actually the closest train station to uh, the uh, Western entrance to the Navy Yard. So um, um, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Chair. I appreciate very much the time and, um, and your willingness to, um, uh, to, to have these questions um, answered in this hearing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Eleni DeCiervo and Christina Roche for EDC and Stephen Hayes for the Kerry Group. Council, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your names. Eleni DeCiervo. Christina Roche. Stephen Hayes there. Yes, Stephen Hayes, can you hear me? Yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and to answer all council member questions, honestly? Yes. yes. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and then you may begin. Thank you. My name is Christina Rausch, and uh, I'm a vice president in our real estate team at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Eleni DeCiervo, who's a vice president and co-head of our government and community relations team. And also the developer Rapsky Group is represented by Stephen Hayes, executive vice president at Kerry Group. And uh, good afternoon, Chair Riley, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to present this project to you today. Can you pull up the presentation, the first slide? Thank you. Um, you can go to the third slide. And the next, yeah, there you go, thank you. So we're here today to request Euler action for disposition of development rights from two city owned lots to an adjacent privately owned parcel. Specifically, we're proposing to transfer 98,446 square feet of development rights to the adjacent site for use for commercial office only as part of a new mixed use development plan for the privately owned site. These development rights on the city owned lots are unusable because they are located under the Manhattan Bridge. So there's limited development potential on those sites. They can only be transferred to an adjacent parcel on the block. So there's a limited window of opportunities for the city to activate the development rights into jobs and other public benefits. In addition, the action also includes a light and air easement above the Manhattan Bridge on the city owned sites. Next slide, please. So these city owned properties uh, are lots 15 and 17. They're located under the Manhattan Bridge in the Dumbo neighborhood in Brooklyn. So on the map in this presentation, they're the white parcels on the right hand portion of the block. So these lots are currently being used by the New York City Department of Transportation for storage of materials, bridge maintenance, other operations. And the transfer of development rights allows the city to unlock the value of this development potential, which would otherwise be left unbuildable given the constraints of the bridge and because there are no other feasible receiving sites other than this slot four. Some development rights for commercial use will remain on the city owned lots to accommodate future, future agency needs, such as if there was a need for a new maintenance building. The adjacent lot, lot four, is owned by the Rapsky Group, a private developer. As of right, they can build 156,000 square feet of residential use on their lot. The proposed project would transfer the city's development rights to Rapsky's parcel for inclusion in Rapsky's proposed mixed use project. The city will restrict the use of the city's development rights to commercial office use only, and Rapsky would use its own development potential for the residential component of the building. As of right, uh, as I mentioned, Rapsky can build a fully residential building, which would be the alternative if it was unable to purchase the city's development rights. Next slide, please. With some context about the origin of this project, in the fall of 2017, EDC on behalf of the city released a request for proposals for the purchase of development rights on these city owned lots. The goal of the disposition is job creation to maximize commercial office development 
in alignment with the city's longstanding policy to encourage commercial activity outside of the Manhattan core. The RFP built on these policies by specifically prioritizing proposals that maximize the amount of commercial office included in any new um, proposed building. The Dumbo area and surrounding neighborhoods of the Navy Yard in downtown Brooklyn, collectively known as the Brooklyn Tech Triangle, of creative and technology employment. RFP saw projects that contributed more contribu uh, commercial office space to accommodate this growing employment. And as with any EDC RFP, respondents are required to commit to MWBE contracting and local hiring plans. So even though this project was released in 2017, which is well before the current COVID crisis, the goal for outer borough commercial use is even more applicable than ever. With a shift to remote work, a desire to be able to work closer to home, this project will create office space closer to residential heavy Brooklyn neighborhoods. Next slide, please. This project seeks to activate the unused floor area on the city on lots into an asset that supports city policies to grow outer borough employment centers, support mixed use neighborhoods, and connect underserved residents with employment and business opportunities. Brooklyn has seen substantial growth since the 2008 economic crisis, four times greater than the national average. The significant residential growth in Brooklyn over the past decade creates an even greater demand for office space. As a primarily residential neighborhood, Dumbo has a smaller daytime population, so there's less foot traffic on the street, fewer people to support local retail during the day. The employees that eventually come to occupy this new space in the proposed development will help to activate the area during the daytime. And lastly, just to mention, this project will help to address the needs for local economic uh, development and employment opportunities by creating a pipeline for access to local jobs by partnering with NYCHA, the local tenant associations, in addition to MWBE and local hiring contracting requirements. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to uh, Stephen Hayes to talk about the program. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Hayes, and I uh, work for the Rapsky Group. And on behalf of the Rapsky team, thank you for your time and your consideration of this ULERP application. I want to highlight the programmatic components, all of which are as of right, and show how the mixed use program informs the building design. From feedback from various community folks, we are striving to create a contextual project in terms of both use and architectural design. And I'm going to quickly talk about the program elements relating them to the drawing on the right here, which is an elevation uh, drawing from Adams Street looking toward the building with the intersection of Front Street on the left side and the bridge behind it. So presenting the program by going from the building bottom to the top in four parts, um, I'm gonna start with the ground floor on the second floor, which is the, the sort of public realm and the ground floor being neighborhood oriented retail, particularly concentrated on the front street side to fill a missing piece on the active front street retail corridor that exists on both sides of the bridge, but not obviously on this empty site at present. Uh, retail will also be going up along Adam Street and um, there'll be separate entrances along Adam Street for the residential and office component and as well as parking and parking is on the second floor. Uh, as we go up the second part of the building is the office component, the subject of this ULERP and that goes to the seventh floor. And as mentioned, this is geared toward expanding the existing creative tech sector in Dumbo and to encourage live work opportunities. Uh, briefly about development, of office in these times during COVID and the current home working situation. Um, we know that the creative tech sector is eager to get back to office working with quite frankly, uh, waning efficiencies and creativity from home work, home working. It's been described to us as sort of treading water at present. Also have noticed the building is gonna be ready in late 2023 or early 24, hoping the COVID has waned and that we're back to some normalness by then. Um, but that being said, the office design is changing. There's no bullpens, larger conference rooms. We're accommodating um, accordingly. Um, I just want to add that Rabsky is bullish on Brooklyn. This is where, where Rabsky is headquartered and bullish on New York as a whole. And we want to invest in Brooklyn's um, commercial future. One last note on the office component from feedback from the borough president and the council members' offices. 10,000 square feet of the office component would be priced at 50%. Uh, below market rent and geared toward local startups and cultural users 
to give them some, um, some assistance. Uh, the third part of the building just above the office is um, the amenity spaces, which are floors eight and nine. Um, that's located right at the setback of this in this drawing, and the setback actually corresponds to the top of the bridge on the back of, of this, um, this drawing. Uh, and the amenity space, of course, is used for the residents and the offices, office users. And above that amenity space is the fourth part of the building, which is the as of right market rental um, residential component with a roof deck and solar farm on top. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, because this is an EDC project, there's a job hiring requirement. And we have heard from various community groups that job hiring should directly affect local residents. So as such, there are two directions we're taking with regard to hiring. One is, uh, one is uh, local hiring for construction and for permanent hiring positions. And the other is NWB hiring during construction. Quickly with regard to the local hiring, we will work with the city uh, with its Hire NYC program. And we've also started outreach with NYCHA's Office of Reese to work with them on training and hiring their tenants on this project or at this project. And uh, we were working with local officials, community and civic leaders and workforce organizations to collectively create uh, early job training and job posting and ultimately to hire uh, local, local folks, both from permanent construction and, dur and during construction. Uh, sorry, permanent um, and then also during construction. With regard to NWB hiring, uh, we're gonna be working with uh, EDC and SBS on our NWB hiring plan. And we'll also coordinate with uh, local officials and institutions as well as the NWB contract community. Of note is that Rabsky has a construction arm which will be building this project and we are sincerely eager to work with the city to encourage everyone interested to participate in this project. Uh, we can go to the next slide and I'm gonna pass this over to Eleni from EDC. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so on the next slide, as Councilmember Levin had lay out, laid out earlier, um, we've been having many, many conversations with the community board and with the council member, as well as the local um, groups in the Dumbo neighborhood. So we've met with the Dumbo Action Committee, the Neighborhood Alliance, the BID, Chamber of Commerce, Brooklyn Partnership, as well as Niger East, um, many of which you'll hear from later today. And overwhelmingly, the top concerns, top things that folks have mentioned as desires are um, investments in the York Street F York Street F train station improvements, um, which you know we're in ongoing dialogue with the MTA. They're doing a feasibility study right now, and so we're looking to see how the proceeds from this investment could um, help make some of those improvements. The public use access to the DOT site, those are ongoing conversations with the Department of Transportation, as well as infrastructure investments in this community. I mean, from the EDC and Rapsky perspective, we are committed to investing a portion of these proceeds back into the Dumbo neighborhood and back into the district. And so the conversation becomes, you know, how do we do that? And what makes the most sense in terms of where those investments need to be made? And so those are conversations that we're looking forward to having with council member 11 over the next week or so um, as we continue through the alert. Next slide. And that is all from us. So if there are any questions from the council members, we'd love to take that now. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for that presentation. Um, I do have a few questions and then I'm going to uh, kick it over to Council Member Levin if he's still here with any questions. Uh, my first question is, um, in 2017, EDC issued an RFP for these development rights under the Manhattan Bridge. Unused development rights exist at numerous properties under elevated bridges or highways. How and why did EDC identify this particular site as an opportunity? Sure. Christina, do you want to take pass it up? We uh, can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? unmute Christina, please? Sergeant, can someone? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. I couldn't unmute myself. I just got unmuted. Thank you. Um, so I know that the city was interested and in, looked at this particular opportunity and said that there may be there may be a um, benefit to selling the development rights off these parcels at this particular time. Um, 
And so that prompted us putting out the RFP. Um, there was a potential development site next door. It's not always the case with trap development rights from the city, but it turned out to be an opportunity that the city wanted to just see whether there was interest in doing a project with these development rights. The stated public purpose of this action is to facilitate Outerboro commercial office space. So why does EDC consider Outerboro office space a public benefit? What kind of tenants do you envision for this space? And are you confident there will be demand for this specific space? Yes, we are confident that there would be demand. You know, what we are envisioning, and, and this goes with alongside citywide policy of having job growth within every single borough outside of the core of lower Manhattan. You know, the, the economic development policy here is really a belief in people being closer to where the jobs can be accessed. And so the goal here is to create um, class A office space, support the existing Brooklyn tech triangle, as well as other office creative tenants that may um, want to expand or already are located within the area and want to continue to grow. Um, we also hope to um, attract new tenants that you know see the value in being located in Brooklyn and want to bring those, those jobs closer to that community. Christina, anything to add to that? Um, I may actually ask Stephen, do you have any comments on demand? Because I know that you've been in conversations with potential tenants. There we go. Um, uh, we, 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 of course, are confident in demand, particularly with regard to the um, creative tech sector. Otherwise, we, you know, we would um, think about it again. But I. Uh, with COVID, certainly we've done a lot of research and we've, because there is of course um, a variety of uh, office sectors that are saying that they might be working from home or continuing for some period of time. But we do know in this sector, particularly, we're told this by our brokers and then also by people who are in the sector directly and talk about the creative tech sector, they really are in need of being back in an office environment. And we know that sector is eager to grow and will grow. So we feel pretty, we're, we're bullish on this. We feel very confident in this, um, this office component. Because Thank you. Demand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my next question, just two more questions. Uh, the, negotiated, the negotiated purchase price for the approximately 90, 99,000 square feet of the development rights is $17.2 million. Some have correctly observed that this price appears to be below market. Can you explain why? Sure. Christina can run through the appraisal that we received and some of the methodology that goes into that. Sure. So the RFP stipulated that the development rights couldn't be sold for less than fair market value as, um, as appraised. So the way that, um, that we think about this is that development rights are at a discount to land value. That's kind of industry standard. So um, the price that we sold, that we have um, negotiated for these development rights is $175 per square foot. So that represents roughly a 50% discount to land value. Then in a discount of that magnitude is typical for development rights transfers. The other thing to remember is that um, the development rights are restricted to commercial office use only. So that's less valuable than residential use. Um, so that's a further discount from any highest and best land sales. Thank you, Kristen. My last question is, the Brooklyn Borough President recommended that DOT surrender control of one or more of the properties it uses for storage in the area for open space and that some portion of the proceeds go to capital projects for the benefit of NYCHA Farragut housing. Is EDC considering these recommendations? This is all part of the conversation that we want to have with Council Member Levin. Um, we've already started that discussion and so from our perspective, we're looking at a portion of the proceeds that could be invested. And so how and where and when um, we're, we wanna figure that out jointly with the council member. Okay. And um, I just wanna give this time if council member Levin has any questions he would like to ask the panel. Thank you very much, chair. Um, uh, I guess my first question would be on um, uh, to, uh, to EDC, have you, uh, been in discussions with the MTA on um, on what um, on how to coordinate around any kind of uh, physical improvements to the uh, to the York Street station. 
I, I, I would direct you to read, there's a, an article that came out just today in the Brooklyn paper about um, uh, how treacherous that station is going and, and, um, and, and uh, using real life examples. In 2003, there was a fire um, on a train that was entering that station. Um, people were um, uh, led to the back of the station where there is no exit. Um, by the police, not knowing that there was uh, that it was a dead end, essentially, um, you know, it's a single exit and entrance um, from this very busy station. It could be really, really, very treacherous. If there was a serious fire down there, um, you know, with the uh, at rush hour, um, you know, with one exit and entrance, I mean, it could it could be a risk of not just smoke inhalation and um, and people. You know, being exposed to the fire, but also, um, you know, being trampled, um, you know, it's, it's a very dangerous station. And so um, uh, this is, you know, I mean, to be totally candid, I mean, like, I, I'm, I want to make sure that the city is not looking at something like transit improvements and saying, you know, that's the MTA's responsibility, not the city's responsibility. And we're not like, um, you know, this, you know, they wouldn't object to that being used as a um, uh, as a as a um, you know a, a destination for this funding if needed. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Council Member. So we we did read the article by Kevin Duggan this morning. It was it was incredibly helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, you know we've been in touch with some of the leadership at the MTA. We've also been in touch at the staff level. So they are working through their feasibility study and we anticipate those findings being available over the next week or so. And so that will inform how this funding could be invested within the MTA in order to advance the conversation around York Station. We believe that the next step would need to be some type of conceptual design. Um, but you know, as, as you know, the city does not control the MTA. And so we would need to follow their lead. We wouldn't have any issues with investing a portion of this funding into that project though. Um, uh, similar con conversations, are they happening with NYCHA in terms of like uh, sitting down with NYCHA about the PNA um, at, at Farragut houses, identifying um, kind of what, where capital dollars are needed and or or expense dollars for that matter um, uh, for uh, the NYCHA community at um, at Farragut. Um, we I, we have reached out through the community affairs team at NYCHA to get a better sense of what the need is, and we have been in touch mm -hmm. with NYCHA Reese. Um, and so we'll we'll continue to work with you to see what what the need is at Farragut mm -hmm. houses specifically. Whether and whether that's capital or, or programmatic. I mean, as I said, we have the funding um, that will be coming as a result of the proceeds of this sale and can use a portion of it to be invested in the neighborhood. And so, you know, how that breaks down between the various projects, we want to work with you to figure that out. It, it does sound like York Street Station is, is maybe the number one priority that you've been raising, as well as um, Farragut Houses potentially having mm -hmm. some programming needs. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, you know, that that York Street station is the single station that Farragut residents use. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a, there's not another station in the, you know, in a probably, I don't know, a thousand foot radius uh, to Farragut houses. So um, um, that is certainly a, a main main pinch point of, of transportation. Um, have, uh, in terms of DOT, I'd like to talk about DOT for a second. Um, Sorry, my children are being loud. Um, what is the, um, the the conversations with DOT about um, opening up some of that space underneath the Manhattan Bridge? Um, it's been something I've been raising for a few years now. Um, you know, it's essentially um, walled off. There's you know a significant amount of public space under the bridge that the public has no access to. Um, um, I know that, that that's not just, uh, there's, you know, I think three or four spaces underneath the Manhattan Bridge, and then one very large space adjacent to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and um, again, DOT, you know, as if you go there, they're about 20% uh, occupied with vehicles, um, mostly unoccupied. Um, you know, at some point there was a boat there, 
uh, DOT Bridges said that that boat was used, you know, it wasn't somebody's personal boat. It was, uh, it was a boat that was used to go out there and inspect the, um, uh, um, the, uh, the, you know, some of the, maybe the bridges that are, you know, the um, parts of the bridge that are the towers of the bridge, the bases, but um, I didn't see any DOT insignia on, on, on that, on, the, on that boat. There's just, you know, but there's, there's, I mean, I see all types of vehicles with out of state plates, New Jersey plates, Pennsylvania plates, um, you know, not official DOT um, uh, vehicles. Um, so um, what's the, what's the status of the conversation on DOT consolidating their vehicles? So I could speak to the nature of the conversations that we've had with DOT to date. I can't speak directly for the agency, um, but our understanding is that the lots that are closest to the site are used currently for bridge maintenance and storage of their um, equipment. And, and that's an ongoing need that we've heard from the commissioner that the Department of Transportation does need to have access to those bridges for ongoing maintenance. Um, you know, we have not made a, you know, DOT has not made a final determination yet as to what is possible, although what they have said is that they are reluctant to give up those lots. Um, and so where, where we stand is that, again, there are proceeds that will be coming from the sale of these development rights. Um, there, is, there are development rights that will be retained within this site um, for, you know, a one-story facility and ongoing agency needs. Um, and so those are, those are conversations that we'll be continuing with the Department of Transportation, and I understand you will be as well. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that I think, um, um, it would be important for me to, that the city, you know, and EDC is the representative agency in this application process, kind of recognize and acknowledge that that this is a real, um, a real issue, and that you know DOT should um, uh, make a real effort to consolidate those spaces. It's not as if um, there's no place for them to go. I mean, just so that everybody knows, I mean, what they've told me is that is that um, there are multiple parking lots that DOT contractors uh, should be able to park in because they have different maintenance contracts. And so, um, you know, the maintenance contract on one part of, on the platform of the bridge is a different contract than the tower of the bridge. And therefore, even if they're both the same company that has the contract, Skanska Team 1 and Skanska Team 2, they need different parking lots to, to, to park in because they can't be bothered to share a parking lot, even if it means that those parking lots are 20% occupied at any given time. And that's basically what they've told me is that, you know, the DOT, the, 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 uh, the company that has the contract on the Brooklyn Bridge can't share space with the Manhattan Bridge because what if they both need to get out of the parking lot at the same time, who gets to go first? I mean, that's basically like what they've said is like, you know, we, we can't be bothered to share space um, we have to be able to offer everybody in their own contract, their own space that, um, you know, God forbid they have to like wait 30 seconds for, you know, another contractor to like get out of the parking lot. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a ridiculous argument. I mean, it's basically as an agency, they're saying that we need 100,000 square feet or 200,000 square feet in a neighborhood, um, you know, because uh, we can't we can't ask our contractors to share any space. So just want to be perfectly clear with the public. That's what DOT has said. It's a totally unacceptable position to me. And if we're going to be selling air rights to one of these spaces, I mean, I felt a little bit like insulted that they decided that they wanted to sell the air rights, but retain one FAR underneath the bridge so that they can, you know, basically the design on that is so that they could they could retain access to it you know, in perpetuity. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate the need for commercial space. I, I, I think that that's a valiant effort. You know, commercial space in and of itself is not a community benefit. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, there needs to be much more going back to the community as part of this, as part of this deal to, to warrant um, the sale of air rights. So just wanna make that very clear. And I'll turn it back over to the chair, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. 
Um, I now would like to invite my colleagues to ask any questions. I do see that Council Member Barron has her hand raised and want to give her the floor to ask her question. Council Member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. I heard my colleague in his introductory remark, remarks allude to the fact that there would be no public access under the bridge if this deal were to go forward. And I would just want the, uh, the panel to respond to that or expand on that. Sure. Um, Christina, I may ask you to step in here. So the, as Christina had outlined in the, the ULERP action that is being taken, the transfer of development rights is for a portion of the air rights that are otherwise unusable because of the location of the bridge overhead. Um, and so those can only be transferred to an adjacent property owner. And the, the Rapsky team is, has this as of right development. And so the city had approached them through the RFP process about um, changing their program from as of right Mercury residential to include commercial so that there would be some type of access by the community for job creation. Um, this is in addition to, you know, building operation jobs, there would be commercial office jobs. The balance of the site, which is everything that is kind of below the bridge, um, those air rights would be, those development rights would be retained on the site. And that's controlled by the Department of Transportation. It has always been controlled by the Department of Transportation. And so it will, um, as of now, continue to be controlled by that, that agency. So there's no plans to develop anything on that site that was marked off that you're transferring. There's no development that's going to go there on that particular location. That is right. And so everything will go on the adjacent site, which is the private site adjacent to the city owned DOT site. What are the plans for construction on that new site, on the site where the rights are being transferred? Sure. Um, Stephen, do you want to walk through your program for how the air, the development rights that would be transferred would change the as of right program? Sure. So um, the, the as of right program is the um, full uh, residential component of the project that I just presented, as well as some of the retail component. The, and that would be a, a building that would be um, approximately the same height, but slimmer. Um, the office component adding to it would be um, added to the floors just above the retail, and um, it would widen the lower six floors that we're talking about, which would be the office, or seven floors, sorry. And then above that would be the as of right residential. So we're basically um, adding the uh, air rights transaction to 100% office development and applying it to the existing building envelope. Approximately how many stories will this new building be? 25. And what is it currently? Uh, it's, it's nothing now. Oh, there's nothing there. There's nothing there now, yeah. Okay, taken. okay. good, thank you. The uh, as of right proposal though would be the same height as the commercial proposal. Right, right. okay, good. Uh, I'm also concerned about community benefits. I'm very familiar with that area because I grew up in the Fort Green projects, which is uh, neighboring to the Farragut projects. Mm -hmm. And as my colleague had said, that's a very dense area in terms of population. And that train station uh, is horrible. I understand that we're looking to see what the city might be able to do with the MTA to make any kind of improvements with that. But in addition to looking at the NYCHA development that's there, there are other community-based organizations that are there. There's a school, there's a public school that's located there. There are several churches that are there. And I would just hope that as you look at community benefits agreements, you would look not just at NYCHA, but uh, also at the other, uh, other entities that are there. I'm particularly familiar with the Church of the Open Door that's located there one block up from where the school is. And there may also be, well, there was at one time, uh, I think uh, a private Catholic school. I'm not sure if it's still there, if that's what it is. But I would certainly want to hope that you have a very expansive, uh, expansive outreach to the community organizations that are there so that they might also see how benefits from this development would be um, available. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you.
Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Levin, do you have another question? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I just want to thank Councilmember Barron for pointing out um, the needs of the school um, at its uh, PS three hundred seven, um, um, which is uh, in in the adjacent the adjacent public school as, as well as PS two eighty two, um, which I'm oh, sorry, not two eighty two. Um, uh, Oh, uh, now I'm blanking. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking. Yeah, two two thirty seven. Um, the there's there's definitely uh, needs in both of those schools, capital needs. Um, and so uh, I would I will definitely be looking at that. And then with regard to the Catholic Church, I think that they um, sometime in the nineteen nineties, um, um, the Catholic Church um, was was demolished in the, like the middle of the night, and um, the community is still very upset about that uh, along Front Street. So. Uh, still very much a, a sore spot for the community. Um, but thank you very much, Councilor Barron, for, for, uh, for speaking to these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Council, are there any more questions for, from any members? Are there any council members who have questions, please push the raise hand button now. I see no other council member questions. Thank you. There being no questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair Riley, I have received word that Council Member Barron is ready to vote now. Okay. So, is Council Member Barron there? We lost Council Member. Thank you. Barron. No, I'm not. I'm here. Thank okay. you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna be voting no on the Lower East Side project, I'm voting yes on the three NCP scattered site uh, application in Harlem. And I am abstaining on the home ownership uh, Harlem open door cluster site uh, pending getting the information that I need. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. One moment, please. I wanna make sure I get that right. So this is no on LU 741. Is that correct, Council Member Barron? Yes. No on 741. Yes on uh, 747, 746, and 745. Correct. And abstaining on 743. Correct. All right. So, um, the the vote on LU uh, 747 remains four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions. The vote on uh, LUs 740. 743, 744, 745, and 746. I'm sorry, 745, 4, 745, and 746 is five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions. And the vote on uh, LU's uh, 741. Let me make sure this is right. Seven forty one to seven forty one have uh, an article eleven. Uh, let me just check this. Um, seven forty one is abstain, correct? Um, no. Seven forty one oh. is a no. Okay, so that that one is four in the no, affirmative, zero uh, one in the negative, zero abstentions, and four in the. Which seven. ones do you which one did you abstain on? Seven forty three. Seven forty three abstain. And seven forty five four seven forty five and uh, seven forty six. Uh, your yes on. Seven forty five forty six and forty seven is a yes. 
and 741, uh, we did that, so no, 743 is an abstention. That's the 743 is a Harlem open door cluster. I'm abstaining, I need more information. 733 and 744, the re related article 11. Oh, okay, yes. All right, so no on 741. So okay. that's four in the affirmative, one in the negative, zero abstentions. Right. You're abstaining on 743 and 744. So that's four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and uh, one abstention on okay. 743 and 744. Uh, and yes, on 745, 746, and 747, Act. which would be five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. Right, we agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. We may continue. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on LU 75269 Adam Street? Yes, there are. If you would give me one moment. Um, the first panel we have on this item is Suzanne Quint, Lincoln Ressler, Evo Stranick, and Deborah Schaefer. It appears everybody is here. I remind you that members of the public will be given two minutes to speak. Do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has announced the time has started. So the first witness we will be going with is Lincoln Ressler. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. You may begin. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Riley. Congrats on your election and chairing this uh, distinguished committee. It's good to see Jeff and and all and uh, Council Member Levin and. Uh, I'm terribly disappointed in EDC. Uh, EDC and the city are selling off air rights from a city owned property in the Dumbo community and have come to this hearing failing to deliver one tangible community benefit for the Dumbo community. After working for years and years on this project, to not at the very end, tail end of a ULERP project, to not have one single tangible community benefit is unacceptable. Nothing on funding for the York Street Station is secure. Hiding behind a new study when we know that New York City Transit has already studied this is disingenuous. This station is a death trap. Every penny from this project, every single penny generated from the sale of air rights toward 69 Adams should be invested as a down payment in the second entrance at York Street. There is nothing firm on securing space from DOT we know their bridges division is totally unwilling to work with us. You should have brought them to this hearing. They should have been answering questions from council member 11 and hearing the outrage from the community about how they block off so much of the Dumbo, uh, uh, so much space in the Dumbo community from us to be able to enjoy. There are, there is not one unit of affordable housing in this project. Not a penny is being invested in needed infrastructure, not one more inch of public space. The Dumbo community isn't clamoring for more office space, a community that has recently experienced an explosion in new commercial space due to the sale and conversion of the Watchtower properties. EDC is handing over significant wealth to a private developer and hemming on and hawing on what we're getting in return. This project, as EDC has laid it out, does not work for the community I'm and inspired. we need to go back to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Lincoln. Our next witness we will be hearing for is Deborah Schaefer. Deborah, state your name and affiliation before you begin. 
Uh, hi, um, my name is Deborah Schaefer, and I'm a, a Dumbo resident for about um, 10 years, and I just want to um, applaud everything that, that Lincoln just said. Um, you know, the, in, in, even in today's presentation, we heard a lot about the commercial space, the commercial space, the commercial space. And I believe that this is really a big obfuscation of the developer's real intention, which is to gain much more valuable residential space by enlarging their footprint and getting a pedestal that they can put the residential towers on and have a hugely, hugely, hugely valuable project without a, a drop of uh, affordable housing included. And as Lincoln said, without any um, uh, community give back at all. I'm the one who was quoted in the Brooklyn Eagle as saying that I, I take, I feel like I take my life in my hands when I go into the York Street station. I use that station uh, frequently and um, Councilman Levin spoke about a fire down there. Well, what if even if somebody had like a medical emergency and needed an EMT, if it was rush hour at morning or at night, you could not get a medical team down there to evacuate somebody. It is, I, I urge all of you who are considering voting for this project to go to the uh, York Street station at, at rush hour and whoever said that the neighborhood is quiet in the daytime, they've never been here. This is the busiest, most vibrant daytime neighborhood. It's full of young families. I happen to be one of the few older people who lives in the neighborhood, but it's full of families and children and dogs and people on the street all the time. We do not need more office space. There was already lots and lots and lots of unrented office space. 10 John Street has been built for years. It's empty. It's absolutely empty. There's un. You, we do not need commercial space. It's of no benefit to the neighborhood. That's already been said. That it's this whole thing is a big boondoggle, and and I'm completely opposed to selling those air rights to. to I'm expired. Okay. No, you you could conclude, uh, Ms. Schaefer. Right, well, I pretty much said everything I was uh, I was planning to say. There really has to be much more attention paid to York Street and to other problems, you know, other infrastructure issues to the crowding in the neighborhood, the vehicular traffic and the pedestrian traffic. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. The next witness we will be hearing from is Ivo Stranick. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but Ivo, please uh, state your name and affiliation before you begin. Great, my name is Ivo Stranick. I'm a member of the Dumbo community. Ivo Stranick. Go ahead, Evo. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Um, so I urge the I urge the council to vote no on this proposal for the following reasons. Um, first of all, you know, adding further strain to the neighborhood infrastructure, people have said, especially to York Street, is a really, really bad idea. Since we're completely underwater in terms of capacity, and since there are over one thousand apartments that are building, being built right around the station in the next two years, we must avoid at all costs piling on additional commuters to this dangerous station, and that's exactly what we accomplish. The problem, the piling on of the additional commuters and adding to the risk in what happens if we expand the size of this building. Now, in discussions with the MTA, they said that this station is, is, is extremely difficult to update. So the chances of them fixing the problem are slim. Now, second is the safety risk and the cost of the added infrastructure strain um, far outweigh the benefits of the $18 million price tag. And in fact, as I've learned, 18 million does not even begin to solve the issues faced by the Dumbo community. And the money's not even going to Dumbo, so that's not even relevant. Now, this ULERP does way more harm than good. And this is, I want to remind the council, the same conclusion that was reached by Community Board 2 and the Brooklyn Borough President. So the entire community is against this proposal. It's very evident that this proposal only serves the interests of the developer and no, and no one else. And Council Member Levin has been in the loop and is well aware of this, but I just wanted the other council members to hear from us and um, so that they know about the lack of some community support as well. And, you know, instead of listing the dozens of additional reasons against this proposal, really the better perspective is what Mr. Kessler said. There's absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, for the residents of the city in this proposal, and therefore there's no reason to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Evo. And last but not least, we will be hearing from the last witness is Susan Quint. Uh, Susan, please state your name and affiliation before you begin. You may begin. Hi, I'm Suzanne Quint. Uh, and I'm a Dumbo uh, resident. My husband also has an office uh, in Dumbo. Um, I am also urging the council to vote no um, on this item. And again, um, stating that there are no, and I mean no, community benefits um, associated with this. 
um, no affordable housing, um, no support importantly for the local infrastructure. And yes, first and foremost, that means the York Street subway station. The York Street subway station gets about as much traffic as Queens Plaza or the World Trade Center Cortland station. We've got one platform, three turnstiles and one egress in the entire station. And this is not a conversation that started now. It's a conversation that's been going on since 2004. And we cannot just have get promises and we'll do a study. And as, as Lincoln said, there's been a study. Uh, we can't support, you know, as a community, we can't support, and we don't think the city can support getting $18 million over here uh, and then not getting any meaningful benefit um, and a safety improvement um, that is needed. And I do want to underscore that that station services Dumbo, Vinegar Hill, the Brooklyn Tech Triangle, um, the NYCHA housing Farragut specifically, and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's the closest station to the Navy Yard, which the city is working to boost capacity on. So how can we, in any conscious, boost that? We recognize that voting no means we do get a tower in that space, um, but we can't support any added density without a safety improvement. Uh, I did want to just say on my remaining time uh, with regards to the DOT land um, that the community does not view turning over the parcel of land that's um, immediately adjacent to this. Um, if that one parcel of land as a community benefit that's commensurate with the money um, and certainly would not be in lieu of a safety improvement there. Um, I mean, that parcel of land, honestly, would be to beautify the developer's space um, and really serves more as a benefit for the developer um, in their valuation than for the community right there. I would also like to respond to the um, benefit of jobs for the community. These are tech and creative sector jobs. Um, I've worked in the tech and the digital sector. They are not going to be hiring people from the immediate community. It's not enforceable. Um, and we don't think that is a community benefit. Um, and frankly, it's, uh, we believe it to be smoke and mirrors. Um, lastly, I'd like to raise uh, that the question about um, transportation density, and, and uh, I am not an expert on all of these proceedings and these documents, certainly, but the amount of square, face, uh, square, square feet, we understand, could accommodate up to 900 people um, as part of this. Um, but the numbers that were used in the application make it so that it falls just under the number needed to request an additional study. Um, so just under the 200 um, uh, commuters during rush hour on the subway. Um, when I say just under, I mean like 198 instead of 200. Um, and so we question, without being experts, we question the calculations used, um, especially as it relates directly to how it impacts the density and the subway usage on um, this dangerous subway. So I would uh, conclude there. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Are there any members of the council who have any questions for this panelist? Are there any council member questions? Please use the raise hand button if you have questions for this panel. I see no council member questions. I think council member Levin has a question. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Sorry, I should have used the raise hand function instead of actually raising my hand. Um, uh, I just want to thank um, members of the public that have testified. Um, um, uh, Lincoln, Evo, uh, Deborah, and Suzanne for, um, uh, for raising these concerns. And I, I certainly um, understand and sympathize with their frustration here. Um, there's um there's a if, if this if this project is to uh move forward this has to be a significantly different um project than is presented right now and um and uh and so i i um you know you have my commitment that i will do everything uh work as hard as i can over the the coming uh four or five weeks to see if there's uh an opportunity to have meaningful 
community benefits as part of this. Um, and um, and I'm going to insist that, um, that that be the case if, if this is to move forward. So I, again, I appreciate it. And I, I make myself available uh, anytime to, to meet with you guys and let you know um, uh, what I've been up to and get your feedback and, and continue to, to have conversations. I'm here. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Levin. Council, are there any more questions for this panel? Are there any more council member questions? Please use, use the raise hand button. I see no council member questions. There being no more questions for this panel, the panel is now excused and I would like to thank you all for coming today and giving your testimony. The next panel is uh, Sinead Wadsworth, or Sinade Wadsworth, Lori Raphael, Alexandria Sika, Regina Meyer, and Michael Nered. Thank you. We will Reminder, not... you will have two minutes to speak and please make sure you're unmuted. Good afternoon, counselors. My name is Tanan Wadsworth, one of the area standard representatives for the New York City District Council of Carpenters with a membership of approximately 20,000 members. I represent approximately 200 union carpenters in the proposed area. And I would like to take this opportunity to share our full support for the project. During these unprecedented times, public and private industries have joined forces to invest in our communities and it is so 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 important right now because we have lost so much last year due to the pandemic this project will provide union careers for the community as well as restore faith in our city and i want to thank you all for your time and your uh service thank you so much and um enjoy the rest of this beautiful day have a wonderful day everybody Thank you, Ms. Wadsworth. I would like to recognize Alexandria Sika. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, but you may testify. Just please state your name and affiliation before you begin. Starting time. Thank you, and you pronounced my name fantastically. Uh, Alexandria Sika, president of the Dumbo Improvement District, the local bid. Uh, I want to say that I support the intention of this action, uh, investing in existing clusters and ecosystems of tech, the tech and creative system, is, which Dumbo is 100% at the top of that list, is seems to be very sound economic development policy for the city of New York, particularly now when we are competing more and more with cities across the country um, for these companies. Um, but I do also want to say that I am really hopeful that there is going to be a good deal for the community coming out of this project. That absolutely means a bunch of this money going to the F train. Um, the MTA has clearly not made this station a priority. And so if we can give them funding to kickstart their effort to transform that station, I believe it's the only way we will get this ball rolling. We also very much at a minimum need to be turning some of these spaces over from the Department of Transportation back to the community. If the city's gonna benefit from this deal, if anyone's gonna benefit from this deal, we absolutely should have the space coming along with it. Um, so we look forward to the negotiations over the next uh, few weeks and hope that a good deal can be struck for everyone. Thank you, Alexandria. I will now recognize Lori Raphael uh, to give her testimony. Please, Ms. Raphael, please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin. I'm Lori, Ra oh, pardon. I'm Lori Raphael. I'm Senior Vice President with the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, and uh, good afternoon, members of the subcommittee. Uh, the Brooklyn Chamber is speaking in full support of the disposition of the city-owned property to 69 Adams. Uh, by the Rapsky Group and is selected by EDC through the RFP process. 
As uh, you know, the Brooklyn Chamber is a membership-based business assistance organization. Uh, we represent the interests of our member businesses, but also businesses across the borough of Brooklyn and uh, through the Brooklyn Alliance, that's our not-for-profit economic development arm, and we're um, conducting business assistance programs uh, borough-wide as well. Uh, under the terms of the transfer, development rights are to be used for commercial office use only to create and support outer borough office development aligned with the mayor's New York Works jobs plan. There must be both MWBE and local hiring plans in place for both construction and permanent jobs in connection with the commercial development rights and pursuant to the hiring program plan. The office portion of the development is projected to bring 438 uh, permanent jobs to downtown Brooklyn. That's a very, uh, it's a significant and important number to us. It's notable that the commercial portion of the project will be 25 stories, the same height as the adjacent as of right residential buildings. The first floor lobbies will house uh, neighborhood retail with street facing windows activating those streets and parking will be placed on the second floor with access away from the corner of Adams and Front, um, also improving um, access in the streetscape or uh, maintaining access in the streetscape. The Rapsigi Group has committed to hiring a full-time community liaison to be readily available and responsive to community concerns. The community liaison will attend community board and other meetings as requested, will keep the community informed of the project's progress and will monitor construction to ensure minimal community out, uh, uh, impact during the construction phase. We are in full support of the sale of air, of air rights to 69 Adams Street and of the measures that will be taken to bring jobs to hire MWB and BE and local individuals and to engage with the community on a meaningful basis. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I would like to recognize Regina Meyer uh, to testify next, Ms. Meyer, can you please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin. Sure thing. My name is Regina Meyer. I'm president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, um, and I thank all of you, um, members of the committee, um, Council Member Levin, and the staff of the Land Use Committee and City Council for, on the, op for the opportunity to um, speak on behalf of this proposal. Um, I'd like to express my support, our support, for the City of New York's proposed sale of nearly 100,000 square feet of unused development rights to 69 Adams Street, LLC, for commercial use. This action will facilitate the construction of new commercial office space, which, as has been noted, um, is in total alignment with the mayor's New Works um, jobs plan um, that uh, calls for investment in emerging commercial cent centers with strong access to transportation. Um, as um, others have mentioned, especially my, my colleague in Dumbo, um, mixed use development has been key to Dumbo and downtown Brooklyn's success. And we must continue to advocate for jobs, especially in the post recovery mode, when we find that having jobs closer to neighborhood work um, to where people live is probably one of um, going to be one of the things that New York City needs to rebound. Um, the mixed use mo model supports those kind of live work um, opportunities that we know people are going to be looking for as they have more and more concerns about commuting into Manhattan. Um, as also has been noted, um, the project will also create hundreds of, jo of new jobs through the and have a um, very strong commitment to local and MWBE hiring. Um, these these um, commitments really, really matter and have also really been successful in other projects in downtown Brooklyn and Dumbo. Um, in summary, I just want to say that this critical new space um, is really important to the future. And um, I look forward to the, um, the um, ongoing negotiation to bring further benefits to the Dumbo neighborhood. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. And the last panelist we will have is Michael Narid. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Michael, um, but you may state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin now. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Narid. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for having this meeting today. 
Um, I am a longtime resident of Dumbo, 40 something years, but now I come strong. I come with 87,000 other members of my 32 BC, 32 BJ brothers and sisters who work and support um, families, working families with prevalent wages. Um, today, we want to discuss the real quick issue of having the support of this Dumbo presentation, I mean, this Dumbo project, due to the fact that due to COVID, we've lost a lot of jobs and a lot of things that went with that, especially in that neighborhood. And we're just looking to be able to become part of a working force back there where we can actually, you know, take pride in what we do there and have a an abundance of people working back there because we've lost tons of them during this pandemic. Um, the Rabinsky, the, I keep pronouncing their name wrong, I apologize for that. The, Rap, the Rapsky group, we've dealt with them as 32 BJ members and they've always had a track record of doing the right things by the, the people that work in our city. The prevalent wage thing is very important because you know with all this new growth that's going on, we wanna be a part of that new growth on different ways. We wanna be able to not just work, but live in the places that we're building. And we know that this city Dumbo is the new midtown Manhattan as far as development is concerned. And we basically, I, I gotta read something to you real quick. I know I only have two minutes, but um, we need to put our working families as, and good jobs in the center of our, deliver, in our center of our recovery. And we can do so through the New York development projects like the ones out 69 Adams Street, by our local development, the Rabisky Group. The proposed development at, Rap at 69 Adams would ensure that Brooklyn families will benefit from our new development where workers can earn a prevalent wage. Summarizing, we need this, 32BJ supports it, and we are more than willing to say yes to this project, and we hope the betterment of it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Council, are there any members who have questions for this panel? Are there any council members who have questions? Please use the raise hand button. I see no council member questions. Council, oh, sorry, there being no more questions for this panel, this panel is now excused. Thank you so much for testifying today. The next panel that we have uh, on this item is Mallory Kasdan, Aaron Komno-Smith, Kelly Catt, and Nick DeSantis. Thank you. The committee will stand at ease while we admit them to the, to the room. Are they all here? Okay. You may proceed. Thank you. I will now recognize Mallory Kasdan to begin. Uh, Mallory, thank you for being here today. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you now may begin. Hi, I'm Mallory Kasdan. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Um, I am the co-founder of the Dumbo Action Committee um, and a Dumbo resident since 2003. Um, thank you so much for listening to us today, and, and we really appreciate being heard. Um, I founded this organization with uh, another woman who will be speaking on here. Um, we felt that we wanted a neighborhood that was um, safe and responsible uh, development wise. And we found that things were going a little haywire, quite frankly, um, in this neighborhood. And um, I had no experience in city planning or community organizing, but uh, it, it seemed to me very important that as people that plan to live here. Um, we sent our kids to our uh, public schools. Um, I'm not planning to leave ever um, to be more versed in how things get done here because it seems often that as residents, we are often caught unawares with the amount of development that is happening. Um, this particular project, I just wanna say um, with all due respect, we had very little contact with EDC or the Rabsky Group. Um, our team at DAC, uh, Dumbo Action Committee, approached them in 2019 in the fall to have a meeting. Um, and we had another talk with a, with a high member there very recently about um, this project of which we have considerable concerns, which my other Dumbo neighbors, I think, have pointed out, specifically the infrastructure 
uh, problem with our F train. Um, and we feel that this is um, a not very um, well thought through plan. Um, we don't feel there's any community benefit as um, my friends and colleagues have said. And uh, we would like to really be considered in a community conversation, not just um, you know, as a, as a bullet point, but we really haven't felt um, heard until now, because now everyone's talking about the F train. And this is one of the things that we've been working on for the last three or four years is trying to get people to pay attention as our neighborhood gets more and more crowded. Okay, thank you, sorry. No, you may conclude. Go ahead, Ms. Cash. Oh, okay. I just wanna say, um, you know, we feel as a community organization that we really need to be heard when we say that um, this building is not appropriate. And we realize it will be built regardless and it will, will be jobs, there will be construction jobs if this gets, building gets built as a res residential tower, but we don't feel that we are receiving any concessions as a community with the additional space being sold. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Kasdan. I would like to recognize Kaylee Catt. Um, Kaylee, please state your name and affiliation before you begin. And I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. You may begin. Oh, all good. Um, I'm Callie Cott with the Dumbo Action Committee. Can everyone hear me okay? Correct. Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for everyone's time. Uh, I am also speaking in opposition to the 69 Adams Street ULERP. Um, as an organization, DAC has spent countless hours voicing our concerns about the onslaught of development in Dumbo. Um, we are not anti-development, but residents have endured the day-to-day -day hardships of living through construction and all of the private developers have come in built their buildings, taken their profits, and done nothing to improve the lives of Dumbo residents. And frankly, enough is enough. Um, we have an opportunity here to finally change how developers work with our neighborhood on an ongoing basis. Without a firm commitment for improvements to our neighborhood and its infrastructure, we cannot support further development here in Dumbo. The York Street F station is a disaster waiting to happen as we've heard about all day. Um, it's poorly designed, overcrowded, and not only just has one exit, but also has just one staircase leading off the platform and only three turnstiles. With so many new residential and commercial units coming online in the next few years, the station will become unusable due to the large crowds and unsafe conditions, especially at rush hour. Um, in addition, this ULERP allows for 69 Adams to add commercial space to the building. While I understand the desire to create jobs in other boroughs, this neighborhood is already filled with underutilized commercial space. The panorama development consists of over 600,000 square feet of class A commercial space and it is empty. There's not one tenant there. The Dumbo Heights development on Prospect Street is virtually empty too. And 29J is a new building that will add over 200,000 square feet of additional commercial space to the neighborhood that simply cannot be absorbed. Class DOT owns many parcels of land throughout the neighborhood and they should not be able to sell their air rights without giving the neighborhood something in return. Many of their parcels sit vacant and are an eyesore to the people that live, work, and visit our neighborhood. In conclusion, this ULERP should not proceed until EDC renegotiates it and gives the, gives the community some real public benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. The next witness we will be acknowledging is Nicholas DeSantis. Nicholas, please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may Hi. begin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick DeSantis. I am a member of the Dumbo Action Committee. I'm also a resident of Dumbo for what will now be 14 years. I'm testifying in opposition to this EULER. I'm going to state some statistics that you've mostly heard already and reiterate some others and hopefully bring up some new ones. We know the York Street Station has a single egress. It is not ADA compliant. It has three turnstiles. It serves riders of every demographic and socioeconomic category. The, the station serves the residents of Dumbo, Vinegar Hill, the Farragut Houses, Fulton Ferry Landing, Dumbo Heights, and Dumbo is the hub for Brooklyn Tech Triangle. The station also serves commuters coming in to City Tech, NYU, and the Navy Yard. The Navy Yard currently has approximately 11,000 people working there, and they plan to expand to 30,000. There are many tourists coming to Dumbo to visit Brooklyn Bridge Park, to see Dumbo, and to photograph themselves on the corners of Washington and Water Street, the most Instagram place in New York City and possibly the United States. The station also serves Dumbo itself. Dumbo has, has the city's highest concentration of technology firms. Dumbo is home to 25% of New York City's technology-based firms. Dumbo is a hub for the Brooklyn Tech Triangle. It is also the corporate headquarters for Etsy and West Elm. 
Dumbo has 1,000 new residential units coming online in the next year or two, and already, as you have heard, has over a million unoccupied commercial square feet. In 2019, the MTA statistics show that the, the station had nearly 4 million riders. That is a 42% increase from 2014. The volume of our station is on par with hubs like Queens Plaza and the World Trade Center Cortland Street. The city continues, the city and state continue to push Dumbo and the areas as tech, work, lifestyle, oh, and tourism but they do not back it up with any infrastructure support. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And our last witness we will hear from is Aaron Cominos Smith. I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, Aaron, please state your name and affiliation before you begin and you may begin. Uh, I'm Aaron Camino Smith. You got it close enough. Uh, we'll take it. Uh, I'm speaking in opposition. I've lived in Dumbo for 14 years now. Uh, I mean, we've heard a couple comments about the EDC pushing for mixed use development. And then that second piece that was finally mentioned was mixed use with access to transportation. It just does not exist here in Dumbo. Everybody loves the idea of mixed use, office, residential, retail. Let's get it all in there. It's a great idea, but Dumbo cannot support it. Even if all $18 million of this transfer went to a new station, of which there is currently no shovel-ready plan that has been created, it would not be nearly enough to even get that station going, even as proposed if it was a down payment. I think my biggest frustration with this is that EDC just basically proposed the number of 18 million and it is beyond a bargain. It is an absolute joke for what Rabsky gets as a result from this 18 million. One, they get an entire office building that they get to build, a massive office building that they will easily break even and make a profit on. But really what they get to do is take residential that would otherwise be at second, third, fourth floor with a building right across the street and instead now place that residential way higher up with beautiful views and get so much more profit. I mean, we're talking probably 40, $50 million in additional profit from that residential. I was looking at their plans. They have a section drawing of what their residential would be as of right. And it would be this single loaded corridor that would only face west, which doesn't even make sense. No one would build a 32 foot wide building that's 200 feet long, but this would allow them to build the building they really want, which is all about the residential. I understand $18 million was based off of a very specific pricing for commercial property, but that's ridiculous. They weren't just buying commercial space. What they were buying with that money is an opportunity to raise up so much more of their residential and make it higher. So I guess that's my biggest frustration. They're not interested in the commercial. They would build this on an empty 12-story platform if they could because of all the extra benefits they get monetarily from the residential. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Council, are there any questions for this panel? Any council members who have questions should use the raise hand button now. I see no council member questions. There being no questions for this panel, this panel is now excused. Thank you so much for your testimony today. The next panel is Melissa Prober, William Taylor, Salisa Hudson, and Doreen Gallo. One moment while we admit the panelists to the Zoom room. Is Melissa Prober in the room already? No, I don't see her. I, 
I, I see Doreen Gallo, Salisa Hudson, and William Taylor. So why don't we proceed with that? And we'll try to lo locate Melissa. No problem. So I will recognize the first witness we'll recognize on this panel is Doreen Gallo. Doreen, mm -hmm. hello, Hi. Hi, Doreen. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin. My name is Doreen Gallo, um, and I'm representing the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance. Um, I've lived in Dumbo for 40 years, so I've seen it all, all the promises made. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance. DNA is asking for the committee to vote no on the city's proposed sale of unused development rights uh, for commercial use. DNA asks that the as of right M1 dash five R9 dash one zoning for 69 Adams have the appropriate percentage of affordable units in keeping with the mandatory inclusionary housing guidelines. 69 Adams is captured in the 2001 one block rezoning. This rezoning was a continuation of the piecemeal development in Dumbo uh, with no give backs to the community. The R9 was a deeply uncharacteristic upzoning adjacent on all sides and smack up against the Manhattan Bridge. This one block rezoning became a catalyst for rampant overdevelopment without preparation for the necessary infrastructure. The commercial corridor is inappropriate at the site, adding too much density within such close proximity to the bridge. There is an oversupply of vacant commercial spaces already and businesses are leaving Dumbo, many struggling before COVID. An R9 building in this rezone 100 J Street was not built until after 9-11. At that time, city planning had the opportunity for a FUCA, a follow-up corrective action, because the environmental review was flawed and clearly still is. Buildings on York and York Street and our state national registers were raised. The heart of our historic district, the Manhattan Bridge, remains an eyesore with DOT rooted under every parcel. Zoning has sanitized Dumbo of its mixed-use neighborhood, leaving DOT with the only industrial use. DNA has advocated for the restoration of the down under the Manhattan Bridge, accessing pre-existing transportation and would avoid privatizing our public streets and connecting our adjacent neighborhoods and being the north entrance to Brooklyn Bridge Park. The city has had over 20 years to address the inaccessibility and the dangerous one means of egress at the York Street Station. Okay. Um, May I just finish with um, saying that uh, DNA will be submitting written testimony and I'll include a historic 1930s photo of the York and Pearl Street stations with intact historic resources. And just one other note, this city enabled the Jehovah's Witnesses to raise historic buildings, sit on those speculative sites and leave with a billion dollars of profit only to give back $7 million for a park that our organization um, initiated and we still don't have that. So please vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. The next witness we'll acknowledge will be Salissa Hudson. Salissa, can you please state your name and affiliation before you begin? And you may begin. Starting time. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, my name is Salisa Hudson. I am with the Farragut Stakeholders. Um, we, the Farragut Stakeholders, are fully aware of the proposals change land zoning on 69 Adams Street. I first want to be thankful to uh, Councilman Levin and that he does acknowledge uh, the Farragut community and that is not indeed part of his district, but just adjacent to his district. Um, the decision, however, has a direct impact on the quality of life for Farragut residents and that the new construct would be a short walking distance and sharing a train station Farragut has frequented for decades before the rapid development in Dumbo. The Farragut community has been disenfranchised and marginalized in the way that the districts have carved them around and developed in all areas its borders and there has yet to be any significant changes, development or cultural programming to benefit the tenants in regards to employment, education or opportunity for upward mobility. The jobs that are always promised to the Farragut community have never followed through, and it's always been exercised in a great farship. The proposal to build commercial space within this construction is both unnecessary and potentially burdensome. The York Street subway station is already operating at capacity for its physical status. The station has one exit for both entrance and exit, 
extremely narrow train platform and a subpar ventilation system. This station without the desperate repair, the, um, without the additional ridership from the proposed rezoning is in desperate need of repair updates and ADA accessibility. This subway station is a danger zone at, the, at this very moment. There are already large buildings being constructed that will con contribute tremendously to the foot traffic of the area and the subway station. We in this area cannot tolerate anymore. In the event, however, that this proposal is passed, it must be under the conditions of funding for updating the York State. Thank you. I'll wrap it up. Just to make it safer for patrons like myself and people with disabilities. Funding for the development of the Farragate community houses and to address the decade-long decade issues of the conditions there as well. Farragate has been forgotten in many of these other decisions that have happened in the city. Please do not forget us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. The next witness we will acknowledge is Melissa Prober. Uh, please state your name and affiliation before you begin. You may begin. Hi, my name is Melissa Prober. I have lived in Dumbo for almost 10 years. And with Mallory, I'm a co-founder of the Dumbo, Dumbo Action Committee. Thank you so much for listening to all of us today. Um, I think you're being sold a bill of goods and I would just ask you to not buy them. They've had over a year to negotiate and figure out a community benefit and they've come up with nothing. They don't, they had their time to say that it can go on and they can keep talking. That's just empty promises. And I really wanna go to what Ms. Hudson's just said. Everything she said is absolutely true. The Dumbo Action Committee has been trying to work with um, developers to help fund 30, um, PS309 and give money to that community and nobody has. There's no money in this program, um, as Councilwoman Barron said, for for the local schools, the NYCHA housing. Um, there's, been, there's nothing. And if you approve, there's going to be no incentive to do any community benefits whatsoever. The ULURP should not be approved without a written MOU in place specifying what concessions are being given and where the money is going to York Street, which I think you know, everyone that lives in the area is knows that that's a big problem, affordable housing, uh, helping the PS309, which really you know, PS309, that P, uh, PTA raises just a few thousand dollars a year where when you go to Brooklyn Heights, a P, um, PS8, they raise $800,000 a year. That school could really benefit from some of these developers um, helping and funding that. You're being um, sold a bill of goods because they're confident in demand. You've heard that, that Dumbo, the commercial space is empty. There's a Wall Street Journal article from December 15th, 2019 talking about it called Brooklyn Startups Face Speed Bumps. And also, I know I'm out of time, but the, you, the, the fair market value, as you heard from Aaron regarding um, how the property is gonna be um, higher and get better views. We are fine with it going on as of right. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. The next witness we'll hear from is William Taylor. William, can you please state your name and affiliation before you begin and you may begin. Starting time. Hi, my name is William Taylor. Um, I'm from an organization called Goose Tenants, a tenants group comprised of residents who reside at some of Rapski's 1500 apartments. Upon completion of the Broadway Triangle and this project at 69 Adams, the number of Rapski's tenants will double. Future projects include hotels and a gigantic 79 story tower at 625 Fulton, easily one of the fastest growing developers in NYC. But there's a huge problem and now's the time to fix it. We yet again find a developer who says all the right things but continually comes up incredibly short. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Rapski's properties have been a nightmare. Absolutely ignoring NYC and CDC guidelines for months, we begged for the most basic of signage and policy. At 26 West Street in Greenpoint, residents were trapped in their apartments while rooftops were rented out and unmasked inebriated party guests spilled into our elevators and halls last summer. A resident nine months pregnant in fear of becoming infected forced to walk down five flights of stairs because of no COVID protocols in place. NYC bars are closed, no problem. Across town in Bushwick at the 500 unit Rheingold building, 
Mr. Dushinsky has wine and cheese parties, indoor movie nights, and a two-story gym with seemingly no rules. In Bushwick, one of the hardest hit locations in the city for COVID-19. What did Rapsky do with the hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal PPP money they eagerly received? Look no further than the abundance of empty units they let sit on the market for 80, 90, 100 days last year with artificially propped up prices. 32% of the population falls under the poverty line of Bushwick, and we wonder why there is a lack of affordable housing. The dots have never been easily more connected. In 2016, the publication Curb New York ran a feature entitled, Will Bushwick Wrangle Development Be a Fantasy or a Dystopia? Five years later, in 2021, we have our answer. While Mr. Dushinsky may still be living in a fantasy land, he is creating fully realized dystopias within our city. Now is the time to stand up and protect Brooklyn. Tell Robski that the health and welfare of our residents are not for sale, not for 18 million, not for 180 million. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. And thank you panel for your, your testimony today. Council, are there any questions for this panel? Are there any council member questions? If so, please use the raise hand button. There are no council member questions. There being no questions for this panel, this panel is excused and I would like to thank you each for your testimony today. Thank you. The next panel is Mary Andrews, Celine Rogakos, and Jeffrey Salvatore. The, the next panel is ready when you are, Chair, Chair Riley. Thank you, Council. The first witness we'll be calling is Mary Andrews. Mary, please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin. Okay, my name is Margaret Brown. Uh, Mary Andrews will not be able to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of her. I'm the Vice President of the Tenant Association of Farragut Houses. You go ahead, Ms. Brown. Thank you for being here with us today. Okay. The Association for the Benefit of Farragut Houses is against the rezoning regarding the lane used at the 69 Adam Street. This proposal to build a commercial space will create additional con congestion, and, and it is already overcrowded uh, by packed by York Street train station which for many years has been used by the Farrakhan community. Due to the increase in development of Dumbo, non-community residents who park their cars and use the train to get to work, in addition to persons from the Navy Yard, the York Street uh, train station has become gridlocked. The station has one entrance, one exit with no plan upgrades. Farrakhan has been overlooked and dismissed. We are surrounded by condos, tall buildings, and new construction, but never any benefits extending to our community. We deserve the same quality of life as the investment that we are surrounded by. This rezoning falls under District 33, Council Member Stephen, Steve Levine, Levin. However, it has a tremendous impact on District 35, Farragut Houses, under Council Member Lori Combo. If this proposal passed with the 18 million funding needs to go to the York Street Station, as well as some form of contribution to the fair community houses, such as summer programs, school programs, after school activities, we don't want to watch any longer while everyone around us benefits and we don't benefit from any of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here and testifying today, Ms. Brown. The next witness we will be calling is Staline Rogakos. I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> Staline, please state your name and affiliation before you testify and you may begin. Hi, my name is Staline Rogakos. Uh, I'm a resident of Dumbo. I was born and raised and have lived my entire oh. life. In can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. And have lived my entire life in Brooklyn. Uh, regarding the proposal, proposed sale of almost 100,000 square feet of commercial air rights to the 69 Adam Street project, 
I urge you all to hear the voice and the concerns of the entire community and vote against the proposal. Based on transit authority statistics, the station is already one of the busiest stations in the system and is one of the very few in the system that has only one exit, making it a potential death trap. Its narrow platform is overflowing with commuters and there are often lines of commuters trying to get in, extending out into the street, which has been shut down on several occasions by the police due to dangerous overcrowding. There is a, already a huge one city block mixed use project under construction at York and Front Streets that will bring over 700 new apartments and quite a lot of commercial square footage across the street from the only entrance to the York Street Station and will bring over 1,500 new residents to the immediate area and will definitely add more pressure to the York Street Station than it can handle. The proposed sale of the air rights at 69 Adams Street will create close to 100,000 square feet of office space and will bring up to 1,000 new employees to the area, many of whom will look to use the already overcrowded York Street Station allowing the sale to go through without mandating and completing a new entrance to the station is a recipe for disaster. In addition, our neighborhood is desperate for parking. Street parking is extremely limited and it is almost impossible to find a spot. Certainly in large number of the thousand additional employees and the many customers visiting those offices will be using cars. And yet from what I understand, there is no parking provided for the proposed commercial space. In closing, I urge you all to take into consideration the voice of the residents that you are representing. representing. Community board number two voted unanimously um, against the sale and subsequent to a public hearing, the borough president of Brooklyn vetoed against the proposal. Approving the proposal disregards the well-being and safety of the current double residents and simply ignores the voice of the community with no justification. Thank you and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Stelene. The next witness we will be calling is Jeffrey Salvatore. Uh, Jeffrey, can you please state your name and affiliation before you begin? You may begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Salvatore, Hello. and I'm a Dumbo resident. Um, I've, I'm a relative newcomer here. I've only been here for five years. Um, but as my neighbors have all very, very eloquently pointed out, um, we are very, very united um, on this um, ULERP application. Um, we would urge the council to vote no on this. Um, I, I think it's interesting because what everyone has pointed out is that there, it's twofold here. There's both problems with the actual development itself and the way that this process has been handled and the fact that we have no guarantees to date. But more importantly is that Dumbo is literally getting nothing in return. Um, there's no infrastructure improvements. We've talked a lot about York Street Station today. There's no commitments. There's no movement towards getting anything to make that station safer. Um, there's been no declaration of public space. There's been no agreement for affordable housing. There have been no programming for PS 307 or other community members. Um, literally Dumbo is not getting anything out of this. Um, you heard many of my neighbors share. Um, we're, we're very understanding that there will be a building built even if this ULERP is not approved. Um, but if we have the opportunity by virtue of this air rights transfer to get something out of it for the community, we would ask that our public servants um, demand more and give us something in return. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. You're not new. I, I'm only 10 weeks new, so it, it's okay that, that you're a newcomer in the community. Um, but I would like to thank this panel. Um, Council, do we have any questions for this panel? Are there any council member questions, please use the raise hand button now. I see no council member questions. There being no questions for this panel, this panel is excused and I would like to thank you all for testifying today. The next panel is uh, someone who is registered as Ms. Corrigan and Arlene Blitz. Committee will stand at ease while we locate Ms. Corrigan and Arlene Blitz. No 
Okay, you may proceed. Thank you. Our, the first witness we will recognize on this panel is Ms. Corrigan. Ms. Corrigan, please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and you may begin. Starting time. Hi, guys. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, we do. Okay, cool. um, yeah, I've been a Dumbo resident for the past five years also, and I mean, I'm pretty much going to say everything. Everybody else said what I was thinking. I was listening to the, um, the proposal, uh, Rabsky's group, and they said nothing. You guys are saying nothing about what you're going to do for the community. It just sounded really like vague and unclear. And, um, and I agree with everyone else. Like we have a school, a local school here that barely gets any money. And uh, the F, the York Street F station is so dangerous. And we also have to keep in mind, we are getting, we have a project coming up with 728 apartments. And on average, you got to average out about three people per apartment. So there's going to be at least 2000 people coming to Dumbo and to build this building and have even more and not even contribute to the safety of the York Street station is beyond me. Um, I really- Sorry, really Ms. Ms. Corrigan, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Can you just state your name for the record, please? Yes, it's Bonnie Corrigan. Thank you. You may so, proceed, go ahead. Um, so I'm just asking that uh, the council votes no on this until we at least get some like actual concrete guarantees that uh, these folks are gonna do something for the community. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Ms. Corrigan. The next witness that we will be calling from this panel is Arlene Blitz. Arlene, please state your name and affiliation before you begin, and then you may begin. Uh, my name is Arlene Blitz. I'm a resident of- Starting Tar. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go okay. ahead. I'm a resident of Dumbo for nine years. I wasn't planning to speak, but as long as my name is up there, um, I want to just, uh, uh, register also as being against this project for all the reasons that were very uh, well put before you today. And in addition, uh, I think this building is huge compared to anything else in Dumbo. We have one area in Dumbo, that, most of Dumbo, that is, um, is zoned for 12 stories. We have only one block in Dumbo that is, is out of that zoning, but there is no building that comes close to this in height. I think um, that uh, the um, people who are in favor of this project don't live in this neighborhood. Um, they're pro-development regardless, and um, I'm just very much against it, that's it. Thank you, Arlene. Do we have any members that have any questions for this panel? I see no council member questions for this panel. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is not excused and I would like to thank you two ladies for testifying today. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 752, the 69 Adams project, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Oh, one moment. I see the council member 11 uh, wishes to speak. Thank you very much, council, and thank you, Chair. I just wanna um, uh, address this to everybody that, that has testified on this topic. Um, that I hear you loud and clear. Um, this is, um, as proposed, is not meeting um, the standards um, that um, any community uh, can expect or um, uh, deserves when it comes to um, public benefits from any action that um, uh, enhances the development potential or value for a particular developer. Um, um, so I am committed uh, to working uh, as hard as I can uh, and dedicating as much time as possible um, in the coming weeks 
um, to making sure that there is something that is legit to present to the community, that it is not vague promises, that it is something that is commensurate with um, what is being given up here, which is, um, uh, you know, develop. It's you know, every development um, uh, potential in the neighborhood is has a commensurate loss of light and air for uh, for others for the community, um, and um, and so I take that very seriously. I I do want to know that when it comes to York Street, which is the overwhelming issue that I, uh, that I took from this hearing, what I've taken from conversations about this project in recent weeks and months, um, this has a potential, um, not a sure thing, but a potential um, to provide um, meaningful funding to, um, to get an improvement to York Street that enhances the public safety and uh, ease of use of the subway station. And that's, um, I do not take that lightly. Um, we uh, do not have endless sources of funding. Um, this is a project um, that I've had conversations with the MTA in recent weeks about, um, and the station that I've had conversations with the MTA about in recent weeks. It's not on, a, the capital uh, plan list in this current capital plan. It's not, you know, uh, slated to be on the next one, um, you know, kind of all things being, you know, kind of all things uh, status quo. So without, without any, without, without funding from this, it's, it's not likely um, to, um, to be on the next capital plan. Um, these are five-year capital plans. Um, and, um, frankly, the, the next station from an MTA system wide perspective, you know, they're looking at um, making stations accessible. Um, you know, they see the next station on the F line at, uh, J at, uh, at Metro Tech as a, that's an accessible station. And so from their perspective, um, you know, the, the very next station is accessible. So it makes it less of a priority to make York Street accessible. You know, I, obviously that doesn't do anything for the residents of Dumbo, Vinegar Hill, and Farragut, um, uh, or the people that work there. But it is um, kind of from a system perspective, from the MTA's perspective. You know, I don't see any uh, likelihood that this is on the next capital plan, um, and it's certainly not on the one that's currently underway. So. Um, now, if this project were to go forward and it produces enough funding that gets that underway, then there's a possibility maybe, and I'm not saying that that's for sure right now, but this is what I'm exploring, um, the possibility that this could then get into um, the, the list of priorities. And so um, I know that that's, that's a kind of roundabout um, uh, explanation of where I am, but but I want everybody to know kind of what the conversations are that we are having and be fully transparent with you all. And I look forward to continuing to do that and engage. And then just one last thing, I, I, I misspoke earlier in a brain fog. Um, I said, I said uh, PS 237, it's PS 287, um, which is uh, one of the local schools in addition to, to PS 307. So my apologies to my friends at, at PS 287. And, um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Council, are there any additional members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Once again, the committee will stand at ease while we wait to check. Are there, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on LEU 752, please use the raise hand button now. There are no members of the public who wish to testify. 
There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing LU752, the 69 Adam Street project is now closed and the item is laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues in the subcommittee council, land use staff, and the Sergeant of Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone.